So here's the deal. Um, we can talk about population stuff. And what I would like to do is skim through a lot of this as quickly as I can, because there's a certain amount of definitions and so forth. Talk about some practical things. And I had thought I would talk about this and maybe go into age structure, but I think I'll wait till Wednesday because I want to make sure everybody's here and things are going on. So let's talk about the density stuff. And um, it'll probably be about 20 or 30 minutes. And then uh, we can call the formal part of the lecture over. And I've got some informal questions for those of you who want to stick around. Um, density. So I mentioned last time that for ecologists, and, and people who are studying animals in series, animals, plants, and series web, you're really interested in what the distribution, the spatial arrangement is, but you always want to know about numbers. Uh, for most of the applied sciences that have to do with um, the impact of biotic organisms, yeah, that's what I'm going to say. Uh, knowing the numbers, knowing numbers and being able to assess numbers is quite an important thing. It's not so important in forensics. It's not so important in bioengineering. It is important in medicine. It certainly is important in agriculture. Am I forgetting another applied science that is biology dependent? Uh, I, I don't know. But, uh, so in the case of some organisms, there's never any attempt to actually count them. Um, I'm puzzled by this, and I've talked to Phyllis about it, because Phyllis knows more about it. So they'll talk about things like colony forming units. I said, what is that? You know, one bacterium? Is it one bacterium enough to form, form a colony? I've, I've always found the way that microbes were assessed to be problematic, because it, it didn't seem to make much sense to me. Um, there's a formal, I think the formal way to state what happens with those is that they use indexing methods. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that here in a moment. But, but let, me, let me back up for a minute. Usually, when we talk about density, it's numbers per unit area. And you can define that area however you want. Numbers per meter, numbers per meter of leaf foliage, if you were doing something, numbers, uh, numbers per acre, for whatever unit of measurement you have. That's of interest or biologically relevant. We can also look at um, numbers per some index other than area and relate that to area. So we could say numbers per tree or numbers per meadow, whatever you want, whatever that means, where we take some feature of the environment and we express the numbers. And then if we were interested in turning that into a real density, we could then convert, well, how many you know, meadows are there in the series? The other possibility is numbers per unit volume. And you might think this would be a logical way to, to express densities when you're talking about organisms living in a three-dimensional space. So that would be things in the air or things in the oceans. But actually, it's not used that much. The only time I, I think I routinely see people talk about uh, volume issues are with things like spore counts. Spore counts are expressed as a volume. Um, insects in the atmosphere are expressed as a volume. Excuse me. May I go speaking? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Go ahead. I think I'm just my doctor. I need to see. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so it, there's not that many examples, but it occurs. <laughs> On a practical level, people are often interested in densities in ways that aren't strictly by area. So for example, I have an orange grove, and I see there's mites on some of my oranges. Do I have to spray? And people would say, well, how many mites per orange are there? Can you estimate that? So those, those, are, those, those are called indexing methods because you express the numbers in terms of some index, some, some value, the sort of symbol of it. Okay.
Now I can stop because that's kind of it. When we talk about population change, we'll keep seeing, we'll keep seeing the number n. I'm going to show you logarithmic code, growth curves and exponential and geometric growth curves. n will be there, and that will be the expression of all this jazz. So, so that would make sense. However, of course I'm not going to stop there. I don't think, I can't remember if this is in your book and I was too lazy or busy to take the fit to check. Um, but the arena by which we determine numbers is this large area of sample. It, it's called sampling. And what I'm going to do is give you an overview of some conditions that are important in sampling. I'm going to share with you some top secret information from World War II. In fact, information that was so secret, it wasn't declassified until 1947. Its first use in biology, I believe, was 1954. And um, I don't know how to do it, and I could teach you how to do it. And what, basically what I, and what I want to do is explain to you what some of the key issues are in sampling. And you heard, so you heard me talking about the, the lab class here before lecture. One of, the, one of the questions I keep asking myself is whether I should teach you guys how to calculate sampling procedures or explain it, or if I should let you live a guilt-free kind of life without having to go into that nightmare. It feels to me like that's a sort of punishment only graduate students really deserve. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's the way I'm leaning. Okay, let's start with these definitions, okay? This kind of sounds like, uh, I guess, what's the course stats? Uh, is it 318, 218, whatever you, whatever you guys say. A sample is a, a, a represent, is, is a, um, should be a random, selection of organisms from the environment for our purposes. It could be other things, it could be soil or whatever, but let's stick with organisms for now, right? It has to be random, otherwise there's some bias involved. Uh, it turns out it's really hard to get actual random sampling. And it's, it's hard enough then that that becomes a thing where you sort of force yourself or force people who do the sampling to actually be random, knowing that it'll never be true. Um, one of my statistics professors did a master's degree in uh, animal science before he, he got his degree in biometry. And he told a story about himself that after he got his PhD, he went back and looked at some of his master's research. And one of the things he was doing there was counting red blood cells of cows. I forget what the treatment was, but they were interested in how it affected the bloods. And so I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity or know how it's done, but when you do cell counts, you, you, you do a smear of blood on a slide, right? You put a cover slip on it, and the cover slip or the, the, the microscope has a grid, and you just count cells in the grid. And you get lazy, you, you do them square by square, and then if you get lazy enough, you count a few squares and multiply those out. He went back and analyzed his data and saw that he, it was, it, his samples that should have been random were not, and he, know he, was, he knew he was biased in his counts. Because he knew what his treatments were, he counted more cells in one treatment than the other. And he said, and I had no intent to deceive anybody. I wanted my data to be good. But when I went back and looked, I saw that I, that because I knew what my treatments were, I was making mistakes on these counts. And he said, I was counting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cells. It didn't take that many, actually, to, to bias them. I've seen this in my own research where I have made a point of not taking samples on my own treatments and making somebody who didn't know what the treatments are do it because I don't trust myself not to make the same error. So if there's some degree of subjectivity. This happens all the time in really subtle ways. Even with, let's say, a bird count where you're doing a transect and you're looking at two different habitats. If you know there's supposed to be birds in one habitat, are you certain you're not spending more time there, that you're not looking more intently when you know they're there versus how you feel when you were doing the sample in the parking lot and you didn't think there was it's extraordinarily difficult to get subjectivity out of sample. And people constantly try to find ways to do it. And so what should that tell you? It tells you that there is a very real likelihood that there's some bias in most samples. And in particular, here's a generic statement. If people aren't correcting for bias, you should be worried. The place where this is the biggest issue, of course, are stupid things that matter to people like polls, 
and they don't want that, such as that. And you can tell that something's not right with the world because if you start looking at different sources with, with poll data, and they'll say, well, we're accurate to plus or minus four, four percentage points. And you compare, you'll often see that those things don't overlap. Can't be that way. So one of the ways we can tell that there's bias in surveys and other things like that, which is a form of sampling, different technique, is that they're uncorrected for bias. Um, if you were to take a statistics course or an experimental design in sociology or any of the social sciences, it's, it's a big nightmare trying to correct for this. It's not easy to design a survey document that does not allow for bias of some sort. One of the things I'm best known in my career for is that back in the early 90s, my buddy Wendy Winterstein and I came up with a scheme where we, we uh, came up with a scheme for assessing the environmental cost for single uses of pest, agricultural pesticides. So in other words, we try to put a dollar figure on what it costs every time somebody hoses down a deal with whatever insecticide. And we did it using an economic technique that's quite controversial, but still widely used, called contingent valuation, where you ask how much someone's willing to pay to avoid a certain outcome. Well, the problem with that, and I'm using this as an illustration of the sampling issue, is that if you ask somebody, let's say that they're, they're concerned that these data are gonna be used to limit their access to pesticides. They may claim that, oh, well, they would, pay, they would never pay under any circumstances. And in contrast, let's say you've got somebody who's taking the survey who's an organic grower and has a visceral hatred of pesticides. They may give you completely unrealistic numbers. So before we ever took any data, we had to have, we had to set up strategies that certain values or certain answers had to be considered out of range. We wouldn't include them in the analysis because we knew that they were intended to try to bias the survey. And the, the term for those things are called strategic answers. Um, okay, so that's a slightly different arena, but I'm trying to lay out some of the same problems. Okay. Can I just screen through these definitions and you nod like you understand what they are and then we can get on with our lives? So here we go. Three things about sampling. First thing, the sampling universe. The sampling universe means what's the whole physical area or physical group from which you're going to draw your samples? So when I poll you guys and ask you questions, my sampling universe is this classroom. And really, it's not this classroom. It's this classroom on a day when these students are here. So it's not even my whole class. It's just the class you have to be here on that day. Item two, how you do your sampling, when you take your samples, the physical arrangement of the samples, all that stuff is called a, is called a sampling plan. Third, as part of a sampling plan, it has things like your pattern, the number of samples you need to take, but it has in there something called the sampling technique. And the, the technique is just how you do it. Now we could have a, an hour long discussion about technique or as when I used to teach insect ecology a few days, things. And, and in honesty, this becomes not so boring, kind of interesting. But let me just make a few comments about techniques, may I? There are active and passive techniques, and it's like this. Active, you go get the sample. Passive, the sample comes to you. All sorts of trapping techniques are essentially passive techniques, and I love them. And all sorts of active techniques mean I have to go, or, or my minions, have to go out in the field and actually collect data, and that's just a pain in the bus. But, but more importantly, it's expensive. One of the goals in a sampling plan, and I'm going to put this on an exam if I can remember. So I'm counting on, and so you guys are about to get this reward. One of the big goals in a sampling plan is to minimize cost. It doesn't matter whether you're doing it for research or you're doing it for practical purposes, costs kill you. One of the things that I think could be a flaw in graduate education, I know it's not on my project, is that sometimes graduate students, same with you guys, 
don't realize that, oh, you've had these things, you're going to go do something, you're going to take these samples. And you don't have a good appreciation for what the real cost is. So let me ask you this question. How much does it cost to have a master's student? Because they don't pay not in the sciences. In the sciences, it's our responsibility to come up with an assistantship for them. How much do you suppose it costs per year for me to have an, a graduate student to do my evil bidding? At the University of, go ahead, 15 grand. At the University of Nebraska, it's currently around 26,000. It'll probably go up to 30 per student per year. Two and a half years, if you're lucky with a master's student, you're looking at 50 or $60,000. I've got to find someplace for these students, which is why guys like me constantly scream, where's the data? Because as much as we're interested in their futures, the reality is it's supposed to be a collaboration. Students are freaking expensive. You guys, on the other hand, albeit untrained, naive, you tend to be cheap. And so, and so while, I don't know, I suppose graduate students are somewhere between pig and slave labor. Undergrads are like the perfect slave labor. And undergrads who are on work study, oh my God, man from heaven. It's that the Lord has looked upon us, embraced us with free research support. We pay, what did I pay? Something like a tenth of what their real cost is. And then, and then the very best is when we have you do research for course credit, in which case you pay for the privilege of being treated like a slave. So, yeah. And so it's always this way. The, the labor costs constantly kill you doing programs. doesn't matter for research. Now, why do you need so much labor? That comes to another issue I want to bring up here. Let's say I talk about tech eight, but what do I do like that? Ten? Yeah. Um, that issue is, how many samples do you need to take? And here's the short answer. In my science, I think this tends to hold across science, there are two words, words that we use that are used colloquially to mean the same thing but do not mean the same thing in science. So let's get that, and that becomes really crucial here. Those words are accuracy and precision. All that precision means is, if I repeatedly do something, how similar are my outcomes? If I repeatedly measure something, are my measurements the same? If I repeatedly sample, are my samples the same? Accuracy is a more philosophical concept in that when I take a measurement, how close is it to the true value? Precision costs like accuracy. Accuracy can, can cost infinite dollars depending on the system. Accuracy is very expensive. I can't speak for other areas of scientific work. I can't even speak for other taxa. But with insect work, we had a rule that if you were designing sampling plans that people were going to use to make management decisions, you had to have accuracy within 85%. If it was for research purposes, you had to be over 90. <laughs> and the difference between that 5% that between 85 and 90 is thousands and thousands. You might ask, if you're doing something, Leon, like measuring a population, how could you ever actually know the accurate number? Because your numbers depends on samples. I mean, you're not God, you're not looking down and knowing what the right answer is. Yeah, how do you know what the true value is? Two ways. One way, which isn't really the real way, is you theoretically know what it is. You know something about the biology of the organism, so you could say, so let's, as an example, let's say we knew that each, each organism had a certain territory, and that was absolute, we know the size of our areas, we know based on that absolute measure, there should be blah, blah, blah. You'll hear people use this by saying, well, you know, the deer populations are only such and such and such, so they cannot possibly support more than X number of predators. But here's the, the get down in the dirt. You used more than one technique try to figure out what the, accurate, what the real value is. You don't depend on a single sampling technique. You depend on multiple techniques. 
And in particular, and we're getting almost to the end of the definitions, you rely on absolute methods rather than relative methods. Or I could say absolute techniques, but I use the word method there, I mean technique. So what's the difference? Relative, this is one that actually works the way it sounds. Relative means you say it's the number of blank per blank. It's the number of birds we counted per hour of being out there. It's not the actual number. It's not a real density. It's associated with how much effort we put into the sampling. Absolute techniques, their, their whole intent and goal is to absolutely determine the number of individuals that are in the habitat. They're always expensive. And you crazy people with your your weird fascination with animals with vertebrates, you're going to get what you deserve because vertebrate ecologists are all about absolute techniques. Radio collars on every one and going out and sending Bray, my, my student, out through the borderlands of Arizona getting literally shot at by drug dealers and human traffickers. Why? So that he could make sure he knew where the mountain lion was? That's crazy, man. We don't do that for insects. We don't play that game. Okay, so absolute techniques. All of the census stuff is absolute. You're trying to learn, and that, a lot of the census techniques, and that's very common for mammalian biologists in particular. Well, I want to know everyone. And I'm going to read or call them all. That's kind of unusual, if I'm honest. It, it occurs with some, even among, even among vertebrate ecologists. You get lots of vertebrates that occur in way too many numbers or in situations where you're never going to get an accurate census. But it still is an important thing to try to do. Usually, if you wanted to know a way to try to get a, an absolute sample, usually this is what you do. You just remove an entire piece of the habitat. And if you do that, then you go through that piece of habitat you've removed and you count everything in it. So what do I mean by that? Well, here's an easy one. You send a box down into the ocean and you let water flow through it and you establish it doesn't affect whatever fish you're in. And then you fire charges or let loose the springs and it slams shut and you literally take everything that's in that water, bring it out and count it. And then you expand that through time. I'll give you an example of a crazy uh, absolute sampling procedure I was involved in. We had a grasshopper outbreak when I was in grad school, and I got there everywhere. And I was trying to take pictures of them, and those little bastards will not sit still for a picture. I would get in, I would get close, maybe eight centimeters, and they always jump. And we were talking about this, and I, I, one of us, I don't know if it was me, but somebody in the lab said, well, do you suppose they jump at night? because they seemed to be really cueing just on visual cues, because I noticed that when we crawled on our bellies, they didn't jump nearly as much. I said, oh, no, let's check. So we went out that night, and you could go pick them up. They're 100% visually cued. So then, that started the brains rattling. Well, grasshoppers are notoriously difficult to, send, to, to sample, because what's the point? You go out there with a net or something, they're jumping away. You're never getting a decent sample. So we did that. We used sweep nets and we tried to collect grasshoppers during the day. Then we went back at night and we got a meter stick and we put it, we were sampling in soybean, figured out, figured out a square meter, and we just slammed big garbage bags over everything. And somebody, two people watched, make sure nothing was coming out of the bottom. We cut every plant off, bagged the whole thing up and took it to the lab and counted how many grasshoppers were in there. And we did that repeatedly a number of nights and so forth. And so it showed what we thought. Um, when you go out with a sweet net and try to collect grasshoppers, you get something, if I, I'd have to look at my own paper, but I want to say it's something like our estimates were 60% too low. But that's okay, then we had a conversion factor. <laughs> and so that's what we argued, that there was a way then to use, even though it's bad, you could use sweet nets as a way to get, get within and use this co conversion factor, blah, blah, blah. Or as we said, actually, when they're that bad that it's making a difference, you've already lost so much yield. Should have done something before. But in the intermediate times, not so bad. You could use that. Okay? 
Probably sampling is the most likely thing. If you were working for an environmental consulting agency or what have you, that's the most likely thing. In terms of doing analysis, it's some form of sampling data that you're most likely to be using. And so figuring out sampling techniques, using them, applying them, and man, coming up with cheaper ways to sample is huge. Okay, let me finish this story with my World War II story. When you take samples, you make your sampling plan, somebody will say, we're going to go out to Nine Mile Prairie and we're going to do transects. And we're going to run a line this way and we're going to run X number of lines and you're going to stop X number of times and go down the whole transect, blah, 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 blah. Right? In World War II, sampling, sampling is not, let me back up, sampling is not just a biology issue. Sampling is a generic issue. It's particularly incredibly important in quality control. So for any industrial process, you always have some sort of sampling procedure in place so that you don't run the risk of producing 100,000 widgets, all of which are flawed. And yet you don't want to pay somebody to look at every widget. Although now with robotic systems, they literally do that with, with uh, remote sensing where they can use an algorithm to look. But back in the day, what did you do? You drew samples and you would, you would see what happened. So World War II comes. And here in Nebraska, as well as elsewhere, we're producing massive amounts of munitions. And it is a real limitation The sampling is becoming a big problem. Why? Because for every single lot of munitions, you have to take something like 5 or 10% out and test fire it to see that that batch is good. And some statisticians recognize that. What if I take that, let's say they're bullets. What if I take these bullets and the first one doesn't fire? And the second one doesn't fire? And the third one doesn't fire. Does it really make sense that I have to go and shoot another 50 bullets when the chances that they're all bad are so high? So what he recognized was there's really two conditions, acceptable or unacceptable. And that if while you're sampling, you can say it belongs to one of these two classes right off the bat, there are circumstances where you can stop. What it really is, what really happens is you define the mathematical, you don't need to write this down, but just so you know, you define the mathematical distribution of the population you're looking at. For industrial things, it's kind of trivial. For biological, not so much. And then your, your goal is to characterize it. And what's the characterization? Some density. So for quality control, they want to know what's the number of bad bullets per lot. And if it's over 10 or over 20 or over whatever their benchmark is, they reject the whole thing. But if you start testing and everything comes out bad, you can make an early decision. It's estimated that that little insight and its application boosted Ameri American and allied munitions productions by 15%. I think it happened in 43 or 44. It was a significant contribution to American productivity in the war. It was so important that, as I said, they didn't declassify the procedure until 47. In 47, in 48, 49, it started to be widely adopted among American industries. And in 54, some biologists realized, hey, we have lots of populations that fit into two categories. We have populations that have an outbreak mode and a normal mode. Can we use the same technique? So these Canadian ecologists <coughs> finding a, a forest pet, spruce bugworm, had all this population data on these worms. And sure enough, they had things where they could easily make a decision whether the population they were studying was in an outbreak configuration or a, a normal non-outbreak configuration. So actually, my major advisor extended <laughs> that one of, the, one of his big contributions was that he extended that theory so that you could do the same thing, not looking at a lot basis, but looking at it on a through time basis where you have the continual reproduction. It's kind of a, it's a crazy thing because then you're looking at distributions through time rather than just straight distributions. But I happen to be, I happen to be getting my degree when Larry worked on that stuff. It's pretty cool to kind of see the ideas and try to get that stuff to flow. Um, Last thing I have to say about this is uh, 
when you read books about sampling, and there's a lot of them, uh, or when you're given instructions to sample, everybody talks about the technical stuff. But when you're on the other side where you need to use the numbers, you really focus on the money. And um, I make this generic statement, which is obvious, but doesn't seem to be. And that is that when it comes to research in general, your limitation is always financial. There's no, there's no I can't think of a single exception where, where money doesn't limit your ability to do research. Now, remember, labor is money. Your time is money. So we're just putting that on a common basis. I mention it here because ecology is expensive. There's a tendency to think that scientific research, it's only that the high energy particle physicists who have really expensive research, and you know, they have hundred, hundred million dollar projects and so forth. But the reality is that ecological projects are incredibly labor intensive and very expensive. And so the fact that nobody's ever been willing to pony up the right sort of funds to fund those things are why so much of ecology remains speculative. There's never been a time in human history, certainly not in part of this modern era, where anybody was willing to pay the sort of money that you should pay. Lots of ecologists have recognized this. So for example, there are relatively few long-term data sets on species. And by that, I mean 50-year data sets. Why? Because nobody will pay for that. And you also can't keep your job if you work on that, because our jobs, like my job, when I was pre-tenure, depended on the number of papers I get. Well, I'm not going to get 50 papers studying 50 years of field mice in Nebraska, a number each year, and so forth. So I'd like to kind of plant this seed that there are insights that are out there if we have the ability to take more samples and to get through this problem, which brings me to my closing comment. The obvious solution to this problem is artificial intelligence and robots. And it's yet another reason why I'm not, real, I'm not just looking forward to our robot overlords taking over the world. I'm going to embrace it because I'm going to get a lot more research done under robot overlords, if I'm ever getting done on these human idiots who run things, robots will know. I assume they're going to be programmed that way. But. Okay, that's it. Thanks very much. Uh, on oh, on Wednesday we'll talk about age structure. That's a, that's actually a, a medium full topic. I thought that this was a fascinating, engaging, thrilling. Should we give them a chance to ask questions about the final? Oh yeah, you guys want to ask questions about the exam or you're all done? <laughs> Shall I tell you where I think the biggest mistakes are going to be? Number one, people are not going to do what I told them to do. I 100% guarantee it. I, I have only looked at one or two exams and they didn't do it. So don't make the mistake. I said, define what a, a marine biome looks like. Will you do that for me? Because that was in the question. Should be, oh, a marine bio would be very based on condition, 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 condition. And here are three examples where those conditions vary, right? Is that hard? I don't know. What else? Question, question, question five? Question five better not be hard. I, 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 I can tell you, question five is not going to be a question in which there will be any mercy. <laughs> that, that's, actually, there's two questions that are without mercy. The, the role of belief in science question does not get any mercy. And question five kind of doesn't get any mercy. I think the others are more speculative. But those two, man, you should know. So the question is, can we just assume that it's got like all the nutrients that we need? Yeah, 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 yeah. I just want, all I'm trying to do is set up a scenario where there's no gravity. And so I'm trying to ask you to speculate on, what I'm really asking you about is, what are all the roles that gravity plays? So what would things look like once you remove them? That's it.